Welcome to the 25-8 podcast. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. Um, we've missed you for a while, Stacey. Where you been? What have you been oh, doing? Oh, God. I've been all over the place. I know. I've been down in Atlanta. I've been... Just, just all over. Are you the allowed place. to talk about what you're doing down there? Um, not or do you yet. Want, or do you want to keep it like well, I think, nebulous and? I think it'll be more of a cooler surprise for our, our viewers and listeners. Um, if we in wait. the weeks to come. Yes. All right. Yeah, be patient. I hate when people do that. It's like, hold on, there's a great, but this have is actually I been, really have great. Have I been going like, oh, I need you to tell me? No, no, no. But it's just you know, on the radio stations, they always do that. They're like. Um, <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, we have such an amazing, you know, something coming up. And then you like listen for an hour and then they're like, and my favorite color is purple. And everybody's like, we don't give a shit. <laughs> but this. How much radio, what, what stations are you listening to? Uh, don't say my life. No, life. I'm not going to. But no, are I'm just local? saying. <laughs> it, all I'm saying is that it it'll just be exciting to have a really good announcement. I'm later very, on uh, if I can say I'm very, uh. Uh, proud and and uh, and uh, hopeful for for you and well, and you. if anybody deserves something that's better than nothing, it's you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Which is like this weird backhanded compliment that just well, kind I appreciate of it. free wrote out of my mouth. But I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So oh, shut your face, shut your face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we can tell me a little. Our guest. Um, this week is, and we're going to split up into two parts because what we're realizing is, is that um, the conversations are, are so good, but uh, I don't think people have the patience for the length of them. So we're, we're, mm-hmm. we're cutting all these things up into, into two parters um, if they go really long. So um, our guest for this podcast and the next one is Mr. Earl Granville. And, and can you, can you kind of get everybody up to speed on who Earl is? Sure. Um, Earl is from Carbondale, Pennsylvania. Um, Carbondale. And he and I are the same age. Um, I think you're just a year or two older than us, but um, we all... I feel so old. <laughs> we, he graduated from Carbondale um, and he joined um, the Marines with his brother, his twin brother, Joe. And they went over um, a couple of times over to the Middle East and different parts. And the one time that Earl did get to go, his brother didn't get to go. And Earl was the lone survivor in an IED explosion. Um, He ended up losing his leg. um, And his brother was extremely, you know, depressed about the whole situation and, and a bunch of other things that we discuss. And his twin brother ends up committing suicide right before Christmas. Um, and it just kind of rocked everybody's world. But Earl has gone and been such an inspiration and has been an inspirational speaker for, God, so many people, every age from kids to older adults to felons to everybody. And he's been all around the world. Like, he like your kids, older adults, felons. Well, I mean, he helped. <laughs> well, because like, that's where he goes and speaks. He does. He does. <laughs> he goes to a lot of the federal prisons. Um, but, you know, he, he also goes, he, he would, like, he went to Columbia, I think it was, and he brought a bag of legs, like, to give to people that couldn't afford, like, their legs were, like, like legs? Yes, like, oh, okay. that were blown off in, like, landmines. And then he helps them to, like, you know, figure out how to wear them and use them. And, I mean. I mean, he's, re- like, I've known Earl, you know, it's it's not like him sit him and I, like, you know, call each other from, you know, a, a, a bubble bath. <laughs> but I've I've known him over the years, and and you know we've we've crossed paths, and I remember uh, Jake Stevens was shooting something about Earl, and that's when I kind of like got introduced to Earl and his mission, and you know his story, and you know he's just like he's just a, like a great dude, and then on top of it, like he's not like like a lot of people know who Earl is, and at the same time he's not one of those like standoffy, no, you know, not at totally all. personable like. Mm-hmm awesome person to sit down with and I was <clears throat> I, I was actually surprised by how good of a conversation that we had it with him and I'm and I'm and I'm kind of like really grateful for it because you know I don't care what he wants to call himself he's he's not a humble bragger um and he's not a bragger so he he for me to just sit and 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 talk with him and and listen to what he has to say it was just like 
I know. I love that. I, there were times, you know, just because of everything I've gone through in my life and what he's gone through in his life. And I mean, we've had phone calls that would last, you know, three and a half hours just sometimes going back and forth. And he's just one of those friends that is really awesome. And even though despite all of the bad stuff, like he's one of those good people that'll still always find the silver lining. And, and even people like me, you always try to stay positive. We're all human. I mean, he yeah, has sometimes good days. we can't he, see have, the silver lining. Yeah. yeah. And so all of us have good days and bad days. And so it's nice to have people like that, that you can talk to and you know, that they, I mean, he's called me too, which is awesome. So I'm glad that you got you know, well, his kindness is contagious. It is, and I love that. <laughs> and he's he's positive, and I love that. And 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 he was nice enough to um, come on on my birthday on July third, and uh, you know that that dude could have been anywhere with friends and family doing whatever <laughs> he wanted to do, and he came down to talk to us, and I thought mm-hmm. that was really nice of him. So, um, this is part one, and uh, part two will be obviously not at the same time <laughs> and uh anything else nope without further ado let's get to the intro <laughs> all right so how are you man doing good I'm busy busy man you're like not all traveling. over the place Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's you're good to like, be home you're for like, the you're holidays. Like weather. You're just like everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, life's been pretty interesting. Uh, just a lot of travel and a lot of uh, speaking engagements and uh, you know, the, working with the nonprofits I'm a part of. And, you know, I, I really enjoy what I do. And some of it I get paid for, some of it I volunteer. But either or, I really enjoy it. And that's what it all comes down to. Is that a, is that like, is that like a, like a, is there a guilty thing there where you're like... I don't know if I should take this money or it all depends, you know, like <laughs> you know I mean? a small nonprofit wants me to come in and speak and say, you know, do what I do. Right. You know, if it's, if it's quite the travel, it'll take me two days to get there, but I understand they have a low budget. Right. And if I have the time, I, I usually state that, all right, you know what, can you at least just get me there and we'll right. work on everything else later. See, and, I, and, and I've done that before and believe it or not, I always feel it's those free ones opens the door to something much bigger like I spoke to team RWB out in Portland Oregon and they couldn't even pay me to get there but luckily I had Delta flyer miles that I, I had was just to gonna use. say for like, flyer mm-hmm. miles. Yeah, they, they, they were going to expire and I and I even told this young woman who asked me to come out I was like look you are in luck because I got to use these are going to expire at that time I've never been in the Northwest so I made a whole I made a vacation over it Okay, so I flew out there for about five days. Is it spoke. awesome? Because I want to go it's to the nice. Pacific Northwest. Oh, man, you know it's it's very uh, a lot of trees, a lot of forest, um, and I actually got to skate more east when I was out there, like east of Seattle and stuff like that, and you hit more of a desert climate and. It's, it's kind of unique out there of how close it is to one another. And I felt like I, when I was in Reno and um, Lake the Tahoe. Little city? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I was in Reno, Nevada, and uh, Lake Tahoe, California, it was the same way. Reno is all desert in uh, California. Once you cross that border, you're in forest, there's mountains, and it's, it's just so weird because it seems like everything here is the same. So when you travel out there, you see a lot of different stuff. Yeah, I wanted mm-hmm. to, like, that was one of the things that, like, I remember driving cross country and like right after you go past Saint, uh, uh, where's the Alamo? The Texas. Alamo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. San Santa Fe. Yeah. Is it Santa Fe. San Antonio. Mm-hmm. Santa yes. Fe. Jesus. <laughs> That's New Mexico. That's different. Um, <laughs> Espanol. Okay. Um, but right after that, like we were like, this is a whole new world, man, and this is part of our country. We never even realized it was there. Like it was, it, like it's just awe inspiring. Like I remember going to the Grand Canyon and. You know, looking out and going like, I mean nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just big. a yeah, I'm just it's a big. speck in the beach, and no one cares. And you know, then I had one of the guides go, "See that rock over there?" And I'm like, "Yeah." They're like, "That's the size of a super Walmart." And I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> yeah, it really puts things in perspective when you look at it that way. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. And my yeah. and and speaking of Santa Fe, like my uncle's an artist, and he lives in Santa Fe, and we went out and stayed with him on the way out there, and and mm-hmm. like, I mean, he is off the fucking grid, right. like. And we looked up at this guy. Remember, that's when I was drinking at the time. And he's like, you got to try all this tequila. And I'm like, I hate tequila. <laughs> so I was drinking all this tequila. <laughs> and he goes, uh, I looked up at the sky and I'm like, I'm like, wow, man, that cloud hasn't moved for like an hour. He's like, what cloud? I'm like, the one up there. He's like, that's the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. And I'm like, 
I never even saw it. Like, it <laughs> Come never, on, really? Yeah, because there's no light pollution out where he lives. So you look up in the sky and you're just like, holy shit, there's galaxies and solar systems and all this shit that you've never seen before. I feel like it we just, need to, like, when we start talking about this stuff. Yeah, right? well, yeah. that's... <laughs> welcome to Colorado. We're going to have right? to go to Vermont. They just yes, did that yes. uh, two days ago. Um, Interesting. I never even thought about that. For, uh, Vermont or... No, 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 what you were talking about. Oh, perspective about, oh, yeah, you go out there and you're just like, oh, my God. Like, if you ever get a chance to go to a place like that and just, you know, at night when no one's around, it's really, like, cathartic just looking and and being like, oh, all right, all the shit I complain about really doesn't matter. No, I agree. I I do the same thing. One of the things I truly feel like is really healthy for the soul, and if somebody's in a funk or down or anything like that, I think traveling is by far one of the healthiest things anybody could do. You know, you could... I find it so stressful. Maybe that's really? because... Maybe that's because of my family. <laughs> okay. I mean, every time you go on a trip, it's a chore. You're just like, oh, well, God I feel, damn it. I travel a lot by myself, so I feel like that's kind mm-hmm. of different. That's totally different. Right? Absolutely. You know, I mean, like I said, like to go back to what we were talking about before, like my first time in the Northwest, and I only spoke for one night there, but I made a five-day thing out of it. I rented a car. Just you? Just me, by myself. And it's, I, I do that so much with my line of work and I love it. And it just, you know, and I, I would find silly, stupid stuff to find. I'm not going to go to the, ball, the biggest ball of yarn. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right, I love know, that stuff. I would, uh, I would, I'd open up my maps app on, yeah. uh, on, you know, all the Apple iPhone. Yeah. And I would just, you know, extend it to Washington and see that and look for a city to go to. Not Seattle, not Portland, something that, you know, no one's ever heard of. And right. I, and I find that on a map and I go to it. All right. And I'm, you know, I'll find a gym. I'll walk around just to see what the little culture is about in right. this little, you know, where we're at. And like, I, I can't even tell you the name of the town, but then I would Wikipedia where I'm at and just see the unique things about it. And somebody said, man, now I, I wish I remember the name of it, but it was this town was the first place ever Nirvana played when no they were shit. first getting started wow. in a little pub. And I thought, you know, and it's not that it's known for that at all, but somebody actually put that in Wikipedia, and I understand it's Wikipedia, but I, then I also think, <laughs> why would anybody lie about that? So I'm just, you know, rolling the dice here, but I'm like, okay, check in the box. I like this. Well, usually, usually the internet people go on there and be like, that's bullshit, and they take <laughs> it down. So I'm assuming it's, it's true. I mean, because that's where he grew up. I mean, mm-hmm. he grew up. In, in Washington in and he didn't grow up in Seattle he grew up outside of Seattle mm-hmm. for those who don't know the, the young kids it's <laughs> Kurt Cobain <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so you're doing all this great shit but right. but like we I, I'm assuming based on our viewership and the people that listen to this is that we we kind of have a reach a little further than if you if you drop a, a pin and, and go 10 miles out of Scranton so we have <laughs> listeners from like all over the world Do you, oh, can excellent. you tell me for those who don't know, like how you got involved and like what you do and okay. what you do, because I think it's fucking amazing. I, mean, I can even yes. just break it down right from the beginning. Break it I down. Mean, you know? Well, uh, in a hurry. Tomorrow's our Independence <laughs> Day. <laughs> <laughs> we got time. So I, um, yeah. Uh, and if I interrupt I you, you won't get offended. Not right? at all. All right, good. not at all, man. <laughs> so I'm a public speaker. So I want to. <laughs> 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 so uh, my name is Earl Granville, and I am. I mean, just looking at me, I'm uh, I'm missing a leg. Holy shit, what up? No, we're, we're only shooting from the waist up. No one can tell. <laughs> so you got yeah. like this fucking NASA leg on. <laughs> I lost uh, my left leg from a roadside bomb in Afghanistan back in 2008. And actually last month was a 10 year anniversary. No shit. So yeah. And uh, I actually went to Ecuador and worked in an orphanage there for the anniversary. I mean, more tragically, two of my buddies got killed that day, especially yeah. Derek Holland. He was from Wingap, Pennsylvania and Major Scott Haggerty from Stillwater, Oklahoma. And I was one of these unique stores. I was moved last minute in my vehicle. And usually where I sit every day is where Scott was sitting. So, I mean, if I sat where I sat every other friggin' day, I would have been killed. So in reality, I, I mean, I looked at this like, man, I, things could have been a lot worse. I mean, what, and it was just unique how everything happened, but I could, I truly believe I got lucky. Scott and Derek passed away and, I got this second chance at life. Right. Now I got to back up a little bit. My whole reason for joining the military was because of my twin brother, Joe. Right. Joe kind of talked me into it, uh, back when we were in high school. And when you say talk into, was it, was it like, you know, I mean, I you need to get your shit together. I would, I, you know, I wouldn't even say that it was more like, Hey man, Paul and I, my, our cousin, we're thinking about joining the military. 
And uh, was I want to say 9 11 thing, or was this was this just this is just before 9 11? This is just like Wait, I this is prior to 9 11. Yes. Well, no shit. I'll lead up to that in a second. So okay. I never thought like. Uh, I, I didn't know what I was going to do after high school yet. I knew I wanted to go to college. Most I didn't don't. know. I didn't. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. I didn't know where I was just some punk little shithead kid. And I, uh, the way how oh, good joke. everyone listening can relate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, be so honest with you. you know, I'll be you know, anybody out there listening. You don't know shit when you're 18, 19, 20 you years don't. old. Honestly, God, we, we all think that, we all think we do. Preach. We all think we do. Let's be, all right. Back to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, so, I thought, you know what? Free education sounds great. That's how I'll pay for college, this and that. And we joined something local, the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. We became infantrymen. Uh, Went to boot camp. Uh, We graduated high school in June of 2001 to see where it was leading up. Landed in Fort Benning, Georgia for boot camp September 1st, 2001. Oh, my God. And 10 days later. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. So I remember looking at Joe when that happened and saying to him, can I curse? Mm-hmm. Fuck yeah, I, I yeah, feel yeah, like yeah, I did curse before. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, I said, dude, you've, you've served your country. You can <laughs> yeah. say whatever the fuck you want to like, say. Dude, fuck this. I'm going AWOL. I am not doing this. And obviously, oh, I, you literally that day were like, I'm. Not, I didn't sign up for this. Well, it, 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 there was a lot going in my head with that, and and I, I remember Joe saying, don't, don't be that guy, man. Don't be that. Because people were. It was definitely there was a lot of emotions going on that day. Oh, like, absolutely. man, we didn't sign mm-hmm. up for war. What the hell's going on? And that's I, our and, generation's Pearl Harbor. I, that's a good way to put it, actually. Yeah, I mean, everybody, I, everybody knows where they, like, when Pearl Harbor happened, when Kennedy got shot in 9-11, everybody knows where they were, what they were doing, and who they were with. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of those seminal moments in our country's history. Man, I remember being in 30th AG, waiting for the process to actually go to a, like, we were in the in-processing portion, because we were just getting there, right? to go to actual boot camp. But we're still dealing with drill sergeants, still, like, in that military time set. We can't use the phones. All that stuff, you are know Are they what I mean? like Arlie Ermey from Full Metal Jacket, or are they... <laughs> no. <laughs> well, okay. you know, I... I, there's I mean, one, they're trying there's to one prepare in you. There's one in particular. I feel like there was very... Like, I look at Full Metal Jacket, there's a mm-hmm. lot of... You know, punching, physical yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Very bare, bare minimum. When I went through boot camp in 2001, it was like... So nobody I mean, got sock soap. We were a drill sergeant. <laughs> no. I mean, I'm sure it happened. It didn't happen in my platoon. Good. I mean, you, you have shitheads there. I feel like that could have deserved it. Let's be real here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so I I didn't go AWOL. I stuck with it. Um, graduated boot camp. Joe and I did a deployment to Bosnia together. Very easy tour. It was peacekeeping. It was towards the end of the conflict over there. You know, NATO was actually pulling out of Bosnia, getting ready to pull. I think we're. That was all that Milosevic stuff, wasn't it? That's what, like, with uh, the the Bosnia Herzegovina, they were doing uh, genocide and yes, and the civil war going on there. And And Clinton wouldn't put troops; he would just drop bombs. I think that's what it was. Well, he and ended up we ended up putting a lot of NATO was very heavy there. So all right. these different forces from all, and it was, I feel like it wasn't even a war. Don't get me wrong. There was a threat, but it's not like it was ethnic cleansing. That's what they were doing. I guess that's a way to put it. Like it was more peacekeeping to make sure they don't keep killing each other. And yeah. these massacres don't stop and these mass grave sites and all that stuff. Like yeah, that's terrible. it wasn't really much of a, you know, pull the trigger kind of conflict. Like we deal now with modern warfare in Iraq right. and Afghanistan. It was more of the peacekeeping side of things. And, you know, came over there. It was, if anything, it was like a duty station. We weren't a lot of posts or anything like that, but I enjoyed it. It was my first time in Europe. Um, you know, at such a young age. Was it your age. first time out of, out of kind actually, of the it area? Wasn't for, actually, it was. I mean, that boot camp, it was, to be honest. I mean, I grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania in Scranton area. So, yeah. So I Bosnia was it. the first time you were like, oh, this is different. Yeah. Oh, pretty much. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. So, was, you, so know, you and your brother both went there. Yep. And then we we got back from Bosnia. We uh, came home and I enrolled right down the road here at Lackawanna College. And I got two semesters in and, you know, being that we're National Guard, you know, not active duty. So right. then we got a warning order for Iraq, but it was a volunteer mission for anybody who just got back from Bosnia because it wasn't, the, it was such a short time. Is span. this like early 2003? This was actually, we got back from Bosnia in 2003. Um, we st- started our train up, I believe, December 2004. Because what was Iraq? March of 2003? March 2000. Actually, it's funny you say that. The day we left Bosnia, March 19, 2003, is the day we invaded Iraq. That was shock and awe that day? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it was called. Honestly, <coughs> yeah, because yeah, no, Bush, Bush gave Hussein, he's like, you got, you got 48 hours to get the fuck out. 
if you don't, we're going to shock and awe. And that was their, 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 their words to explain what they were going to do. And I remember, you know, live on TV, it was like, all the reporters are like, we're waiting. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was just, boom, 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 boom. you know, I think that was a little before then. This was the initial actual boots on ground invasion. Yeah, after. They, didn't, they didn't invade yet. They were, the first thing they oh, were doing was, was just, yeah. bah, 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 bah. that was a little before then, but okay. the, in, the actual initial invasion were boots on ground. These like, I guess you could call it major push of military forces. It wasn't even that fully, but it was the first time I feel like besides green berets or CIA or all the cool military stuff, Navy seals, this is the first time when it was actual like brigades kind of jumping in there. And it was right. marching, from my understanding anyway. Yeah. So there was a big joke when we left Bosnia that they were just going to show us right over there. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. it was like, it was uh, like, this it is your just, captain speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're doing a big, U-turn. unexpected <laughs> pissed yeah. up. Uh, <laughs> so did you go to Iraq? I didn't go to Iraq. It was a volunteer mission and I was going to stay back, but Joe volunteered to go. So I decided to go to. And where, and where did you guys end up in Iraq? Um, the brigade, actually, we were all, we were kind of separated, but a, a, a huge chunk of the brigade was actually in Ramadi. Okay. And in 2005, Ramadi was pretty heavy. Yeah. And at I my, that. my battalion was, uh, was split up as well. Half were in Al Saad, and one company itself happened to be in Ramadi with Brad, Bradley Fighting Vehicles. And, you know, I feel like we, us and Al Assad were doing a lot of convoy security, more more on the defensive positions, and you know, pulling the trigger once in a while. But it was nothing like what those guys were dealing with. And I, I don't know if you guys being from here, you remember back in September of '05, we took major casualties for a guard unit. I feel like, um, I mean, we lost Billy Evans on September 19, 2005. Wait, your your battalion did? Yes, yeah. Billy Evans is first. He's from New Milford area, <coughs> up, right up north on 81. Right. And then um, nine days later, we hit even a bigger casualty. Uh, a Bradley hit a, a white phosphorus IED, and we lost five cash, five people in one IED blast. And I feel like for a guard unit, you know, that, that's, heavy. that's That's a, like when everybody's from the same area. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're. Any any casualty is a, you know, heavy casualty. Let's be real. Any yeah. death is is emotional. Their talent take it, you know, whatever it may be. But for five in one incident, and actually, we'll even put six in a matter of nine days. You know, that's and that's pretty, heavy for an area. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, George Puglisi, um, Arnold, and Lee Wiegan, and uh, Brown and uh Slobodnik, like five dudes and i i knew a few of them personally nothing uh not all of them but uh i remember puglisi was my squad leader when i was um in carbonell's uh guard unit when i where i first signed up and then right. after boot camp i was transferred to honesdale's unit and he went to new, new milford's unit and so i knew him pretty well and i'm really good friends with uh his nephew justin who right. and so you know it we all take a big toll on that yeah and I'll be honest, in my time in Iraq, it was, um, I, I joined the military for selfish reasons. I joined for an education. That was it. You know, I'll do a wear the fucking uniform for a few years and that's it. But my time in Iraq made me love what I did. And all those things I felt like people may take for granted, you know, I, being a part of something like that, all the purpose that comes with it and all the passion. I mean, look at blue cord infantry or whatever it may be, whatever your path. Like I've never, it, I never experienced anything like that. Yeah. I played sports I mean, I mean, in high it, school. Is it like the, the camaraderie of it? Is the camaraderie, it camaraderie? You feel like you're making a difference. And you know, sometimes I, I'll be honest with you. I fully don't understand what we were doing in Iraq. I don't. I'll be, and I'll be honest. And I don't want to even At the go, time, did you? A little bit. I feel like, and I, I won't go too much into it. Why or why not? But all I know, none of that shit even really mattered. I had a great, great group of guys around me, and we were in it to look after each other. Yeah. Whatever it may be, even though we weren't in that initial danger like those guys in Ramadi, we were still in somewhat, not as crazy, but there was still a sense of something I never felt before, and I loved it. I so really, I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I've no, been, no, you're I've okay. been, I've been, I've been spending. Um, I like to watch all those things on Netflix that. Are, are documentaries about terrible shit 
<laughs> where my mom watches Discovery Health and I'm like, oh, I can't even <laughs> deal with that. I, I, so I, I, I got kind of transfixed in uh, uh, Ken Burns' Vietnam mini series that he did, which is about 10 episodes, mm-hmm. two hours each. And there was an episode that I saw two nights ago where um, they were focusing on, on uh, uh, about minorities being disproportionately uh, being lost in combat compared to, you know, waspy, white, Anglo-Saxon, Caucasians. Check. Um, and th- they said, you know, there, I mean, there was racism. There was, and, I mean, we were talking 1971, 1970. And they're like, you know, a lot of us hated each other. Right. We fucking couldn't stand each other. A lot of the black guys are like, you know, I fucking hated my my sergeant. I hated every, he's like, but the moment we got out there, all that shit just went away. You it's know, we, we might works. go back, we might go back and be like, you know, and furthermore, go <laughs> fuck yourself for that thing that you said before. He's like, but when we're out on patrol. It's like everybody had their back. Everybody had each other's back. And it was, it was weird how it was, everything was forgotten and it was all about each other. You know what? In a little bit, I'm going to discuss a piece that I've dealt with something like that. Okay. I, um, in a little bit I will, because I've, dealt with something like that in a very vulnerable part of my life and it's and it's exactly what i'm thinking of as you're saying that okay cool but um put a pin in it don't let us forget (laughs) actually yeah yeah, that's that's wow so yeah so you're in i I just had a light bulb yeah (laughs) yeah, did did you just have an epiphanal moment wow okay yeah because i I, I understand. Stacy Mover only needs to lay down on the couch. We're going to do this. <laughs> then, uh, All right. Yeah. So now, tell me about your childhood and what, uh, <laughs> yeah, what your favorite color is and was your mother mean? Um, so you're in, you're in Ramadi and I was in is, Ramadi. I was in outside. 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 Okay. Yes. So, so being honest to say I went there for selfish reasons. Right. And then being there going, you know, in a, st- I, I don't, I, if I'm speaking at a turn going like, I, I feel like I have a purpose right now. And like, this makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like I, it, I'm not even worried about like the school shit right now. Like right. I'm, I'm with, I'm with my brothers and I'm with my family. Exactly. Well, it's, it, I'm part of something bigger than myself and it's not about me anymore. It's about us. Right. And this, and in this conflict, in this deployment, I became an NCO. So like a sergeant. So basically okay. I'm, I'm, I know a, nothing about <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah. so, or basically I'm now, you know, to break it down like civilian style, I become like a, a low manager in charge of people basically. So now these guys are my responsibility and it builds more of camaraderie and responsibility. And, you know, I have felt like, yeah, I've, I've worked when I was a kid, but, um, and I played sports, but I've never felt it in an atmosphere as such. And I felt like I was I was decent at it, and I loved it a lot, and I got respect from my guys, and we all we all got along very well. And um, sometimes we wanted to pull each other's hair out, but I think for the most part, this is something like it. It's just the experience of it, dealing with the hardship together, and it, and I don't mean the hardship of even just pulling the trigger together, but dealing with some of the military bullshit that we all have to deal with once in a while. I mean, is this the American military bullshit, or is this like the Iraqi forces bullshit? The American military bullshit. I mean, let's be honest. There's there's just stupid tasks we have to do, and hey, we have to do this together, we have to do that together, whatever it may be. And I think anybody out there in the military knows what I'm talking about, like. You know, where's your PT belt? Kind of dumb bullshit. You know? PT belt. <laughs> PT belt is something you have to wear. Just a, a very bright yellow or orange belt you clip to yourself. And if you're gonna do PT, you have to wear it because that is that's gonna stop you from getting hit by a bus. Yeah, you read it. You're looking what? at me like, what the fuck? Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, well, this is the thing that I feel like sometimes higher enlisted. Or higher ups worry yeah, about that, 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 yeah, that, like that. Basically, to me, is like if you catch a firefly, you don't have to pay taxes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what does that? What does that mean? But you know, and you know, I won't get too wrapped around something like that. But I just like, and I always think to myself, if we're over here in a combat situation, and that's what you're worried about, you must be really bored. <laughs> that's what I. That's what I, always, that's what I always think of, like when I see that stuff. When I now is your brother like, with you at the time? Joe was in Iraq. Yeah. So Joe and I. Well, like I said, Joe volunteered for Iraq, and it made me want to volunteer. And it going to Iraq, like Bosnia was one thing. I left Bosnia, like, eh, okay, that was fun. Well, not. But going to Iraq, which I feel like was life changing for me. Yeah. And it and people, we we look at Hollywood and all that bullshit, and like, you know, we think it's like such a horrible place, or like, I feel like sometimes Hollywood expects 
us, anybody who deployed, it's like the guy who works in finance that they're pulling the trigger 24 seven over there. Right. It's not like that. Sometimes it's a lot of fucking boredom. <clears throat> Let's be real here. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, it, it is, it's a lot of video games and, and, uh, going to the gym and, uh, fucking jerking off on Porta Johns. Man. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> honestly, like, you, look, I'm, God bless America. I'm almost done. <laughs> I'm Your almost tax done. dollars at work. All yeah. right? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, look, I, it, I, I, I know it, <laughs> if I can, um, <laughs> I the Pope says it's okay, right? <laughs> and at the same time, it releases endorphins in your head, so you're not in lieu of Prozac. What a great release! I'm taking care of myself. All right, I think right. I think, myself, I, think right? you, I think you are too. <laughs> what because, else did you do in the Middle East? <laughs> well, it's, you you escape, hang out with the camel spiders, and then yeah, uh, <laughs> and then you go to the Porta Johns. And, hey. you, and you hit the sand, and you're like, well, all right, I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was I mean? Do you? So let me ask you. Let me ask you a question about the people there. Mm-hmm. Not and and I'm and I'm talking about the Iraqi citizens, like. Did you look at, because my, my only frame of reference to any of this is, is watching documentaries, right? right? So I'm not brave enough to do what you do, but I, I, I want to know what it is so that I can appreciate it and respect it more. Well, believe it or not, I feel like on my, my roommate deployment. in college was actually an Iraq war vet and yeah. he was, yeah, all he did all day was play World of Warcraft and threaten to kill me. So like, <laughs> well, great I, guy. We share the same birthday. I should tell him today. Happy birthday. <laughs> it's today your birthday. Today's my birthday. Yeah. Get the hell out of here. Yeah, and I'm spending it with you, you fuck. Oh, what the fuck, man? Well, I better get a good interview for you. <laughs> yeah, you better, you better tell me Here's something no one else knows. Like, you better but, tell me that Michael Cohen knows something. <laughs> So we my gotta, time we gotta it, break news here. I'm thinking like deal with the air. I didn't personally deal much with the Iraqi people. I mean, and I not saying it was good or bad, but from my understanding, did they look at you as invaders or did they look at you as liberators? Well, um, I feel like or was it some like did, half and some half? Did it. I, from my understanding, that's what I felt. Um, some loved us being there. Some hated us being there. Some people were loyal to Saddam, and you know the Americans basically decided his fate. Yeah, and some people wanted that liberation of dictatorship. You know, I, of, can I, can not, I, I wouldn't even say dictatorship of just him <clears throat> being gone. I and, and I won't go, and I'll go back into that later. Like I feel like you know, this is a country that's been full of dictatorship for so long, so it's all you know. Right. You know what I mean? And, and then to bring democracy, they're like, what is this? Ex- well, I think they're, I personally think like, oh, we have to liberate Iraq. I was like, hang on, I just think we need to get that guy out of there. Right. Put a, I think you, and when it comes to politics, who are we to say what, how a country should be run, okay? I mean, we could, we could have a good politician, we could have a bad politician, no matter what it's like. I mean, you could have possibly somebody who treats their people- Like shit. Very, like shit, right? As a dictator or a communism, but whatever. But he kept maybe. the peace, right? Kept the peace and took, takes. He will, Saddam. You know, if as long as he's taking care of his people, which something Saddam, I feel like wasn't doing. No, you know what I mean. But especially up north. Oh, it absolutely. Yeah. So I feel like when it comes to, um, like, I this is just my opinion here. I'm not speaking for everybody. I think because we put democracy in there and I don't think it worked the way we wanted to. ISIS invaded even after we gave the Iraqi military all those, all our fobs, our military bases. We gave him and one Abram tanks and our up armored Humvees and ISIS rolls in on pickup trucks and the Iraq military just runs away. The Toyota pickup trucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I drive a Toyota. I'm like, oh, I guess I'm not a terrorist. So do right? I. So do I. <laughs> yeah, but I drive an SUV. You can't really mount a gun onto the top of it. But I, anyway, <clears throat> I know we're kind of getting off topic here i always this is the whole fucking show earl (laughs) (laughs) i well i truly believe that like maybe it wasn't democracy maybe we need to just put the right person in there and still keep our presence in iraq like just like korea then this is just my opinions here yeah just like we've done in korea just like we've done in germany but and i feel like there'll always be a threat there because this this modern warfare we're dealing with now iraq and afghanistan you don't know who your enemy is you're not fighting in uniform I mean, anybody. Well, so 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 go into that, and me being the ignorant, and please don't let me over talk you, Stacy. <laughs> I feel terrible, but you're no. just you're over there, just like <laughs> no. um, watching this. Can and it's mo- the most recent thing on my mind is this right. Vietnam documentary was like 
for the first time, the American soldiers didn't fight conventional warfare. They were fighting against guerrillas. They were fighting against people who would, you know, run in, throw in a bomb and then get out of there and just go into a hole. Right. And you don't know who your enemy is, Mm -hmm. you know. So meanwhile, like you're sitting ducks. And I think, you know, past this prologue um, and I think history is, is a great thing to learn from. So I... I'm now having like this crisis of, of, of trying to understand where it's where it's like, you know, the, the, the current form of warfare is like we've never seen this before. And, I, and, I, and I'm and I'm watching this documentary going like, but that's exactly what, you know, the the, the Vietnamese, like the, the North Vietnamese and the, the Viet Cong would do. Right. Is like this 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 infiltrate get out real quick. Where's the enemy at? Like, we don't know. I mean, they're taking mass casualties, but the damage that they're inflicting, I mean, you, it's, it's insane. Well, I feel like with Vietnam, like, the government was still, like, we're still fighting in government. You know what I mean? And, and, yeah, it was. And I am it, a little was, ignorant. When I am a little ignorant, I may be ignorant when I say this, but for, that was my understanding, and, like, it was hard to They were to constantly detect. putting in puppet governments in, the South Viet, in South Vietnam that the South Vietnamese didn't support. Okay. And the Viet Cong, it was Ho Chi Minh, and Ho Chi Minh was actually a guy. I can't even believe I'm saying this, but he was a, he was a Marxist Leninist that actually, at the beginning, like, like even when uh, uh, who was it Truman was right before Kennedy, this all started with Truman, and uh, Ho Chi Minh was actually saying like like look, we agree with American values, like we don't take don't don't be mistaken. You know, we 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 believe in your freedom and we believe in in the rights that that your people have. You know, just don't think of communism as such a bad, bad word. And he was trying to get peace. That and that was my understanding from what my what I said earlier of like, as long as I feel like there's no, uh, I don't want to say like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, there's no crazy Geneva Convention mass murders or like your government's, you know, committing. I don't want to say genocide, but these mass murders or anything like that. Yeah, you could probably have something peaceful, of. <laughs> You know, like I control my people, but I'm going to treat them well. Does that make sense? Yeah, the, the South mm-hmm. Vietnamese didn't do that. Okay. In that in that time, they it was it, it actually ended up being like an autocracy where okay. they were where they were like we're going to put my brother as the head of defense and then we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna kill everyone who disagrees with us. Mm-hmm. Well, I think when we when we start rolling into these countries and try to. I mean, just give them it's democracy. Very, it's very hard to come in in an APC and say, we're bringing peace. Well, it's like, yeah, well, yeah. Well, peace is not always democracy. No. I think I feel if your culture, if this is all you've known is somebody controlling you, this isn't just on a flip of a switch. There you have democracy. You can elect your president. Everything's going to be good now. Obviously, we, not look at the Iraq, we look at the Iraq war and what happened <clears throat> and ISIS and these mass murders and what ISIS has done. Over there, like th- that's a prime to me. That's this is just my opinion here. The prime example of where democracy always doesn't work when it comes to it's like not we, a one we, size fits all for everybody. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, we have, to, we have to look at the people. We have to look at the culture. And I look at like you know even in Afghanistan with us coming in and fighting the Taliban. You know the Russians fought the Taliban in the nineties and they got their ass kicked. They yeah. lost. Yeah, I mean, and I and Russia's I feel like is a military similar to. The I, I don't care what anybody says. They're a superpower. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, they it, have it, the man. really think about. But now Afghanistan, I think, is a whole different war. And we had to go in there because of what happened on 9-11. Absolutely. You know, and in my opinion, like I said earlier, my opinion on Iraq, did we need to invade Iraq? Afghanistan, that's a different story. Yeah. Okay. And in both Iraq and Afghanistan, we're not fighting governments. Okay, in Vietnam, I feel like there was a little bit of government, but like you said, it's puppet governments here and there. And I feel like even the Amer, from my understanding with Vietnam, we were trying to dictate who is going to be like a politician, who's going to be the new whatever. Oh, it was the, all that stuff. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. So I mean, I I I I don't I didn't understand much of Vietnam. From my culture, I know the people in my shoes back then got treated like shit when they came home. That's, mm-hmm. I mean, that's probably as far as it goes. I mean, in Vietnam, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, like, oh yeah. When they there came was, home, was, yes. they were just protesting, like all the. It didn't. Like, it, 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 terrible. It, 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 it. You gotta watch it. I can't. I What's can't it even paraphrase. It's literally called Vietnam. It's called Ken Burns Vietnam. Just on Netflix. Yeah, and it brings you all the way up to like because what happened is is did you see that Spielberg movie recently, The Post? I did not. But you know about it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Oh, oh. it's you. This is my <laughs> grandmother calling me to tell me happy birthday. <laughs> oh, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Eddie, she's 94. I'll fucking talk to you later. <laughs> Jeez, um, man. Holy shit. No, so, so, I mean, there was a lot of, there was a lot of just... So like, and, and that was the thing to me, like when, when we went, when we, when, when 9-11 happened and, and I think, I think by October, like late October, like we were in Afghanistan, like we were, we were, we were, we were there fast. It was, and then it was and, mainly just like, you know, I, cause they I, wanted to remove the, uh, the Taliban. Right. It was mainly the elite military, like, uh. you know, Green Beret. Yeah. Special forces. Yeah, stuff and, like that. Navy yeah. SEALs. And like, I, I, I couldn't even tell you when the actual push for Afghanistan was. The only, and I feel like the only reason why I remember Iraq was because in my personal history, the day I left Bosnia was the day we left at Iraq. But I think by the end of 2002, I mean, we had a big presence in You're, Afghanistan. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and then I feel like, like what, um, it, I feel like they are two different wars. To be honest with you, and I think what I don't biggest, disagree with that at all. You know, I, I think it's a lot of the terrain that, it, believe it or not, and I feel like we've uh, um, battling the Taliban and Al Qaeda. Like, I, like I said, I didn't do much trigger pulling, and I, I can say that with respect in Iraq. Right. You know what I mean? But I feel like just the terrain itself made it two different, completely different conflicts. Yes, they all fall in the global war and terrorism conflicts that we're dealing with now, but I think. As somebody personally being over there, I feel like they were two different battles. Now, there, what was two, two different conflicts? Now, how long were you in Iraq? About a year. And then, like, aren't you supposed to do like a year, and then you're like, you're out, or or how does that work? What do you mean, like, like out you do of a country? tour? No, no, no. I mean, like, you get to go home. Thanks for your service. Oh yeah, well, that's well. I did my tour. Like I was staying before, I did my deployment in Iraq, and I loved it. I re upped my contract over there. Something I how, never how thought was I did. It? It was hot as balls. <laughs> and you have like, what, 50, 50 pounds of gear on your back? Yeah, well, body armor and uh, you're carrying your ammo within that body armor in your pouches, a right. rifle, Kevlar. Yeah, it definitely gets hot. You have to accumulate to it, definitely. And you have brother, to hydrate. Your brother was, was there too for the whole year with you? Yep, Joe was there. We didn't see much of each other. We were in different platoons. But uh, Joe re-upped over there, and then I realized how much I enjoyed my job as mm -hmm. serving in the military that I re-upped as well. Something I never thought I would do. <laughs> Honest to God, I truly feel that. So when Joe and I came home, right? <clears throat> now, I, when did you guys get home? We got home June of 06. Okay. So we came home. Um, I went back to Lackawanna College, got some more education in, and we got another warning order, and this one was for Afghanistan. And for the guys that just got back to Iraq, this again was a volunteer mission. I jumped on that immediately. I fuck, fuck you. This is what I want to do. And Joe, you know, stayed back. He stayed back because he, um, you know, his life was going um, in a direction where he was now a father, and he had a full time job as a corrections officer at um, SCI Waymart. And That's out towards Honesdale, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. 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 Probably yeah. in between here and Honesdale, yep. actually. Okay. And I, I. Um, and Joe's my responsibilities um, being changed home, well, my family now. Yeah, but we were, we were rumor had it we were scheduled to go back to Iraq in 2009. And right now, when I, this warning order came, was the end of 2007, and he would be forced to go to that Iraq deployment. So he was trying to coax me into staying home, you know, and you know we could go back in 2009. To Iraq. Yeah, and I said nope, I'm cutting this cord. <sighs> Deuces, I'll see you later. It's something I wanted to do, and while I was over there. Um, you know, I, I was promoted to staff sergeant. I got, you know, new responsibilities. Now, what you, now when did you go to, when did you get back over to Afghanistan? I, we landed in Afghanistan, uh, February of 2008. Okay. And, uh, you know, a lot of training up in Fort Bragg before then, but. Did you have yeah, all your buddies from Iraq with you? Some of them. Okay. Not, you know, only a few of them. So <clears throat> a lot of new guys met. A lot of those guys that were actually in Ramadi were in my platoon. You know, so hearing their horror stories and what they, yeah. you know, and they, they all seemed okay. And I don't mean horror stories like, oh, they're, they were traumatized, but you get what I mean. No, but they saw mm -hmm. some shit. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So while over there, uh, yeah, that's when, you know, all this shit happened. I lost my leg. Oh, that was June 3rd, 2008 when it all happened. And one of... Uh, Can I pull you and, back to not just skirt over... The, the leg thing. What do you mean? Did, you, did you're you feel a lone survivor. <laughs> it's in, in a weird way, but 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 did you did you like within the first week? You're like this is this is different. What losing my leg? No, being in Afghanistan. 
what like just my surroundings and everything no you're like this is this this just like did you ever get that feeling of like this seems different than iraq or this Um, no we had a whole different mission there i'll be honest with you like we were part of the providence reconstruction team and each um each providence had their own we call the prt each providence had their own prt and we were in paktia providence which is eastern afghanistan and we were our i guess you could say our duty station or whatever we're we were in Fob Gardez. So Gardez was the capital. And that's where we're at. And our mission over there was now I said in Iraq, I didn't actually interact with a lot of people in Afghanistan. I, we interact with a lot of people and I, I gotta tell you, man, they're, they're just human like you and me. And I'm going to, yeah. and I'm going to move forward with that in a second. And I'm going to get back to that when, you know, when I talk about this, but, um, we were helping rebuild hospitals, renovating schools, building wells uh, for villages so they have water, um, rec centers, and. Um, I mean, were the Afghani people like "fuck you"? No, I didn't. I mean, I'm sure some were, but I remember when we drive by. Well, school. there's the same thing about people who think about Nickelback. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are like I love them. I fucking hate them. Boy, that's a good way to put yeah. it. You either love it or hate it. Yeah, I mean, but was I mean, you didn't seem to get like, and I'm and I'm ta- I'm not talking like resistance as in like with weapons. I'm just talking about where it's like you know the Charlie Brown like I don't want to fucking I don't want them here. Right. You know. Well, you know, I think if we ever did deal with that, we didn't. I didn't see a lot of it. To be honest, I'm sure it definitely absolutely was there. No doubt about it. Yeah. You know, this is a country that now the Taliban has taken control over pretty much. I mean, I don't know the logistics and they're radical, of the government. they're radical like Islamists, right? They're radical about their yeah, religion. Yeah, they seem like, you know, from my understanding in the 50s and 60s, Afghanistan, like women were covered. There was a lot of was equal very rights liberal. there. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but I Iran think... Iran was like that too. Yep. And yeah. I think... For whatever it was recently, they they went from that hardcore, I, you know, and I have nothing against Muslims. I don't. I'm not one of those. No, neither uh, do I. You know, I feel like people look, who served like. There's assholes in every religion. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And this is what I'm kind of getting at. Yeah. You know, what I what I mean by that, there's these hardcore Christians who say you have tattoos, you're sinning. And then there's also these hardcore Muslims who are like, you know, women are not allowed to drive or right. they need to be covered up. Yeah. You know what I mean? I truly yeah. believe it's the extremists when it comes to Christianity and some of the Muslims that, that kind of ruin it for everybody. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. yeah. You know, and I can well, be because, totally because, wrong. Because they're the vocal minority. They're yep. the ones who are trying to rally the people because they feel like they're sent from God or right. something. It's like they have this higher mission besides, you know, protecting our country. Like we have to, the infidels and whatever they want to call them. I mean, like, you know, I was going back to Vietnam. I mean, they had mm. slanderous terms for the Vietnamese people. You know, they're like gooks and slant eyes and that's what they were taught in basic. And, he's, and they're like, when we get over there, we're like, they're not. They, they they were using they were making us use these words to hate right. them instead of instead of being empathetic to being like you know maybe we need to maybe we need to listen right instead of just you know get the fuck out I boom. am not gonna I can't how could anybody judge a person from the culture that they were raised in for all they know okay you know what I mean mm-hmm. it's not my fault that they were born there and they're in this regimen that's completely corrupt and controlling the Taliban and um, I personally don't think war is supposed to be personal you know the it day, shouldn't be the, the day I got hit right yeah it wasn't like hey I know those guys in that vehicle that's a vehicle we're gonna hit it wasn't like that you yeah know, it's never like that let's be honest with you I see a bunch of Americans let's try to kill them that's what it goes. It's, well, it's, I see the enemy. Like it's personal to the country, yeah. but as an individual, it's not like that. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I was and and look, I like like I said, I watch all these documentaries, and and the great thing about the Vietnam thing is they they half the interviews are with the Vietnamese, right? And they're going, you know, I remember I remember this whole platoon was coming over, and we just we just mowed them down, and like that bothers me till this day, like that this we is, do, that we did we that, and this is the Vietnamese saying this. Look, we're all human. Yeah, we're mm-hmm. all gonna have these feelings. And something I'm going to discuss too, like the day I got hit, okay? And I'm going to go back to that pin we were discussing. Yeah. My buddy, um, I'm not going to say his name or anything, but he was the other, another staff sergeant in our squad. We had, um, the way how that, on that mission, we had two staff sergeants and I was one and he was the other one. And we were screaming at each other, like at one point, like. You it and just, you were. Yeah. And my role that day, I was a, I was a gunner. Okay. Yeah. So. Does that mean you're like you're up the top? Yeah. Like, I'm the guy up top. And that's usually not my job. It's like a 50 cal? Or there's 
there's 240s, there's 50 cals, there's Mark 19s. Bro, this just goes to show how much I don't know. <laughs> no, it's all right, but 50 cals, one of them. You okay, know, all right, is. all right, good. Honestly, close. <laughs> I think I had a 240 that day, and I had my own personal weapon, right. uh, you know, an M4. Yeah. And I also had a 9 mil on my, on on my your body chest? armor. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we were screaming at each other, some miscommunications, and... He was looking at me for what is this vehicle doing. I was like, look, man, I am not in charge of this vehicle today. Major Haggerty is, um, you know, you're yelling at me. And I said, I want you to go say what you just said to me to the fucking major in the vehicle. Cause I know you're not going to say that, you know? Right. And we were, anyway, it was a lot of fuck you piece of shit, blah, blah, blah. Just screaming at each other. Right. I mean, is that just the temperature of war? Sometimes that well, happens. Sometimes you just have bad days and you get on each other's nerves and things aren't going the way you want it to in the moment. And you, you get agitated and you take it out on each other. And yeah. that's what happened. Now, that's what family does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yes. We're going to fast forward 20 minutes later. I'm laying on the ground, bleeding to death, and everybody else is killed in my vehicle. And this dude is praying over me. You know? The same dude you were just yeah. 20 minutes earlier. Yep. So if, if you don't mind me ha- asking, like, just to put people there, because I think people need perspective sure. yeah, and yeah, clarity. I, okay, so what happened was... Like, did, did you go on a convoy, or...? We were, we were actually on a patrol. We finished what we were needed at that day. And I think we had one more stop to stop at, um, uh, they were, were in a town called Zormont and what they were doing, I believe was, um, I think there was like a, an opening of a hospital or something like that. I can't fully remember what happened. We had to go to some ceremony where the local government was, we were, they were opening something. And Almost like I, a protectionary force just to make sure like no psycho. I think we were there. Well, I think that prior PRT to us helped build that. So they yeah. just wanted our, pre- even though physically wasn't us, they wanted us there and probably for protection as well. Let's be real here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And on the way there, we had an ID. Okay. Now I was the last dude talking on the headset. Okay. Yeah, were you vehicle. like in the top of the, yeah, the, yeah, I'm, the Humvee? I'm like You're this. standing I'm up, up, right? I'm, I'm standing up. Yeah. I'm the last guy talking on the headset. And, um, all I remember was I saw nothing but black. Um, I felt a momentum and what I heard. So all my senses here and what I heard, you know, when you put your head underwater, it's just a faint noise. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I heard. And my mind was still working. And I remember saying all that's going on, black, faint, a, mo- a momentum. And my mind is going, what the fuck is going on right now? When I woke up, my feet were not uh, backwards, not fully 90 degree backwards, but they were enough to say they were pretty backwards I'd say like you know maybe if you're looking at a clock like the you know maybe the four and eight way beyond a ballerina Absolutely. can do yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. they were pretty fucked up right and I was full of blood and I'm kind of just like looking around and I was like holy shit we just hit an IED you know what I mean yeah like this is heavy alright so um, like what's your like what's your your like is there anxiety is there well at first i'm thinking to myself is everybody else okay um are we getting ambushed and you know that pistol i had i have no weapon now i i did have that pistol right side story to that that pistol it was defaulted i would pull the trigger when it would jam so i'd have to rack it back pull the trigger rack the rack it back pull this trigger oh my god like the old so west like, well i i went to go turn it into an armor and they would have to ship it to bagram to get fixed because we lived on a little fob right. i got it back and it was still doing it and i just like well whatever man i i fucking tried i have my <laughs> well i thought to, in my mind i think it's not myself, funny but at the no, same no, time no, it's like right. jesus it's, christ well, in my mind i like i have i have a rifle and i know i'm much better than a rifle than a pistol. And honestly, I never shot in a pistol in the army until I went to Afghanistan. Everything I used was a rifle. Right. I feel like that's what infantrymen use, but because we're part of the PRT, we got a rifle and a pistol. I just didn't like the pistol. But in that moment, I thought, holy fuck, I wish this thing were only now. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen. I, you know, I, we didn't know if it was an mind, ambush. Right. And in my mind, I'm thinking I'm fucking useless right now. There's nothing I could do. I'm just going to bleed out and die. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was it. But we didn't get ambushed. We didn't. Okay. You know, Scott, I learned uh, by the time the medevac chopper came that Scott and Derek were killed. You know, we did have an Afghan governor in my vehicle as well. And I'm going to point this out when you said talking about the people. But I just want to pinpoint that. And he lived. I think he ended up passing away because I got to tell you, he looked 10 times worse than I did. You know what I mean? He looked. So you had a representative from the from the Afghani government? Yep. 
Yeah, in, I, think, I, I believe he was. Uh, yeah, I, I believe he was. Yeah, I don't know what. I don't think their governor is the same as our, rank what as we our think. governor. But yeah. he was a politician. We'll just put it at that. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was a politician, and he was much older than any of us. He's probably the oldest guy in the whole damn convoy. Um, but he he looked pretty fucked up. So anyway, and it, what happened? I mean, like I said, Voda was praying, or I don't want to say his name, but anyway, he was praying over me. And, and I remember 20 minutes prior, like I said, we're screaming at each other or, right. and, and I, I think about this every day. It doesn't control my life though. Every day I think about, this. I remember rains running past me, you know, you're going to be all right, Granny, you're going to be all right. I remember my LT coming up to me and, and I guess I was the first person he got to and he said, Hey, don't, um, hold on. I got to check on the other guys. And then he looked off and, you know, when it comes down to it, if you work on when it comes to the medical you work on the guy who's worse off. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he went to go check everybody else. And I'll right. never forget what I said to him. And I wish I didn't fucking say it. Cause I said to him, you know, and I'm, I'm sure it may stick in his head. I was like, don't leave me here, man. I don't want to die alone. Right. Something along. And I'm sure that didn't feel good for him to hear that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But, was that, I, but was that an honest moment for you? I thought that was it. I thought I was dead. I thought, I mean, looking at the blood, I couldn't stand up. I couldn't, like actually do anything like you couldn't sit on your ass no i couldn't do anything I, I i that this is it this is it for me see you later world i honestly thought and how that many was people it. how many how many american troops are in this convoy we had four american vehicles two mraps and two humvees and in front of we had two afghan police officers in front of that and two afghan vehicles behind us so we were the, my vehicle was the fifth vehicle in the convoy. Usually you know. they, don't they hit the first to stop everybody else so that they can do an attack? Well, it's, it's all different. It's all who's pulling the trigger. And, and I, to I this mean, these day, are guys that well, like are hundred yards away with a cell phone. Well, I, we don't know if it was pressure plate. I, all the rumors start like maybe yeah. the other four just missed it and we were the unlucky ones that got it. Right. Maybe it was remote detonated. I don't know. All I, like, and actually, it, it doesn't even matter now. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and I heard it was two pressure plates that were above a one five five round, and the vehicle was completely fucking destroyed. Like, I so never, did you get like popped out of the top? Yeah, I threw. A, I was I was whipped out of the vehicle, and I wasn't wearing my gunner's harness. I, I, the harness is what it does is if the vehicle rolls over, like not from getting hit. I mean, it, you could call it that. If the vehicle is about to roll over, it keeps the gunner inside the vehicle. Um, so he doesn't fall out of the vehicle and the vehicle right. roll over him. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, in this situation, in this, well, and I always, I always debated that. I was like, well, when you hit an ID, I feel like you want to be blasted out. And if I look, we're not going to a place where I feel like there's not a threat. We're going to roll this vehicle over. Right. So I am just going to fucking like not wear it. And I, and I, and I, as an NCO, I always said to my guys, it's up to you. I'm not going to make you wear that thing. Like, do you think not wearing that was 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 p- pivotal to you and I, I and Stacy sitting Honestly, here talking to you? God, uh, the way the vehicle looked, I won't get into it, but all right, I'll get into it a little bit. Like the roof was peeled back, and I'm thinking to myself, if I stayed there, that roof probably would have, like, just I don't know. To so me, you're almost like a like a like you got shot out almost. Yeah, that's what I felt. I yeah, I was shot right out, and uh, wow, I think. I got lucky, you know, like I said, I wasn't wearing that harness. I feel like that not wearing that harness saved my life. So anyway, out of all this, like, you know, Doc Jones was our doc, the Air Force medic. I know, like, we worked with other branches in the PRT. Right. So Doc Jones was working on me, patched me up. Say, I always give him credit and the rest of, you know, the Mohawk. We called ourselves, we were Mohawk 4-3. And I said, you guys saved my life. Oh, I didn't fucking do anything. We just doing my job. Shut the fuck up. You guys saved my life. Let's <laughs> yeah, be real here. Yeah, like, stop being humble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, oh, we're just doing our job. Like, no, man. Like, really, yeah. I, you guys are in my debt. Let's be honest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, okay. can, you can easily say you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to say that, though. And that's what I, you know, I feel like that's a. I think that would bring a nice sense of humor to the moment. You know, we need some levity and, and, and terrible things. So, well, so you, keep going. To talk about. That pin we were discussing before. Right. About, um, well, I guess that was what me and Voda, but also another thing I wanted to bring up was the idea of how these people were. Now, I mentioned we, we had an Afghan governor in my vehicle, right. okay? So, the day I got hit, you have to put me on a litter, right? And you put on Is a litter. Is it like a stretcher? 
Yeah, like okay. a stretcher kind of. All right. You know, it's not like one metal with wheels. Like it's one that people have to carry you. Like yeah, it's like a two four, poles on two the sides. Two people on each side. Yeah. Or, yeah, this one I think is just a cloth one with cloth handles. You just pick up a move, like it's real right. mobile to move with. They put me on that, put me behind one of the MRAPs, did some more buddy eight on me, waiting for that bit of a chopper to come in. So did they tourniquet this, you? Uh, yeah, I, I got... Uh, all the work they were doing was actually on my right leg. The leg I got to keep. <laughs> I was, yeah, I know it sounds weird. Yeah. This leg looked 10 times worse than this leg. But internally, when my left leg is why we amputated the left leg. Like, I, I didn't lose my left leg until I hit Germany. And I got surgery there. But I'll get into that in a minute. But when they... Uh, when I was moving, when they picked me up to move me, I couldn't remember everybody who was, I think it was like Voda, the LT, uh, maybe Stoney, who was an Air Force dude, or Reigns. But there was one guy in particular, I remember, and it was one of the Afghan police officers. And there's a reason why I'm getting here with this, okay, to go what we were talking about before, all right? And it made me think a lot different of these people over there, okay? This guy, like, it was me and this Afghan governor that I lived. Like, I, people say you were the lone survivor of this blast. I said, Technically, in the U.S. side, this Afghan governor lived as well. I I don't know if he's still alive or not, because like I said, he was pretty fucked up. Yeah. But, all right. Anyway, um, I got on the litter, or when we got on the chopper, they put me side by side with this Afghan governor. And because he had his own escorts with him, they took one of one of those guys with us as well to continue to be his escort, not a whole truck full of people, but right. at least he had one with him for his own personal security. Sure. I, mm -hmm. I respect that. Yeah. So they took the same guy who carried me on the litter. All right. Now, meanwhile, we're sitting side by side in our medevac chopper. And at this point, it's not like, when you in shock or, uh, I mean, I started going to shock a little bit when they gave me morphine though. It helped a lot to be it honest. Yeah. <laughs> honest to God, honest to God, it, yeah. it did. I got loopy. Oh, I love you guys. I, I remember that. I was yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I guess there goes my dancing career. I did. <laughs> and I, wow. Talk about humor and, and uh, tragedy. God, All well, right, there good. was a realization where I think I knew I was going to live at this point. Right. Does that make sense? Like, so, so you have to, you have to find like, you know, a little bit so that everybody else isn't freaking out. Like you feel like I, I find yeah. that in tragedy where well, somebody I has to like, say something humorous to kind of break the mold for everybody else. Well, I think there was like a, like I, like I said that what I said to the LT that day, that fucking killed me to say that. And I think in the panic moment that I was in thinking I was going to die, I reflect now and I was like, fuck, maybe I shouldn't have said that. You know what I mean? Maybe I should have been more, but I just started to panic. No weapon. No, like I, yeah, my broken pistol, but so you acted I'm, like I'm a human useless. being. I guess you could say that. Yeah. But I still beat myself up for it. And I, it's not that, it, like I said, it doesn't control my life anymore. Right, right. You know, and I had to work on that, but we'll get on that later. Um, so you're in this chopper with this governor. And I just started, I just held his fucking hand. The like, governor. Yeah. I'm just like, well, look, man, to me, it's not Afghan American soldier, politician. It's like We're two, two human humans beings. trying to yeah. fucking mm -hmm. live. And I was trying to look up and look at my legs and his escort kept pushing my head back down. Right. And I tried to sit his up and escort. just, yes, his escort. And I, once again, I looked up trying to, trying to do what I can to look at my legs and I pushed ahead and asked for the second time I looked up to see who was doing it and it was that fucking Afghan and he just shook his head at me and started like rubbing the side of my head and like the compassion that came there and I'm like here we are like and to go back what I said yeah what did I say earlier here are two human fucking beings all right here's a guy who was just born in this war-torn country in this environment in this culture in this government and how am I gonna fucking judge somebody on that you know what I mean? Yeah. He's showing me compassion right now. And we're always mm -hmm. told, don't trust these people. Don't trust these people. Because we've had like them, they just automatically just turn around and not to my squad or platoon, like technically, not none of my guys. But we hear stories of it all the time. I'm at Walter Reed and you just see these guys with gunshot wounds when like police officers that they've worked with for months. And then one day they just turned on them for whatever it may be. I don't know what it is and I won't get into that. But my point being, we're always told not to trust them. And this dude was generally looking out for me. All right. Fast forward. I went to a mass unit. They patched me up, made me more stable. I was probably there. Not even an hour. I'm still conscious. They get conscious him just the whole time. Yes. They got me and this governor back on another medevac chopper from there. And they shipped us right to Bagram hospital. Okay. And, Right there is where I feel um, like, you know, at this point, um, my commander's uh, at the hospital. Um, there's some other big wigs like 
you know, just seeing how it was doing. And there was this guy, Sergeant First Class Young. He was actually my brother's squad leader in Bosnia. And I didn't even, maybe I did. And I just, at the time I was like, what the fuck are you doing here? I didn't even realize he was in Afghanistan. Yeah. And he's sitting there talking to me like while I'm in this hospital bed and like blah, 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 you know, typical shit. Right. In comes in, once again, this Afghan police officer, okay? Really? And he comes in. He doesn't fucking speak English, but w- there's a compassion, once again, seeing how I'm doing. You know, it, we, I don't know what the hell he's saying, but we all know body language. And I was just like, man, you blew my fucking mind, man. Because I'm thinking to myself, we all, like I said, we all... You know, we can't trust these people. Don't trust towel heads or whatever the fucking towel yeah. small-minded humans could be sometimes. I'm right. guilty of it. We all are. Yeah, we, we all are. Be real. We all I mean, are. We, yeah. we all could be. <clears throat> you know. But, I'm Irish and Italian. I hate myself. <laughs> 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 but in, in those moments, I feel like, um, you know, it just, there was a reflection. You know what? And what happened after that? I, you know, doctors came in. We need to do surgery on your right hip immediately. We went in, we went under for surgery. The next thing I can remember, I'm being woken up with my breathing tube being pulled out of my throat. Oh. And, you know, and the nurses are there. They're like, oh, it's okay. Like, I guess it's, you know, we got to wake him up. It's time to get up, right? Yeah. And then I, um, they pull the breathing tube out and I talk like this for the next like eight days or some <laughs> shit like that. Because I guess it was in my, you know, down there for a while. And, doctors there and initially there's you know small talk and he said look I, oh and I, I realized now I'm in Germany so I was oh you didn't fucking know you I didn't you, know where the fuck it you was were in a yeah. different country yeah <laughs> so I'm in Romstein Germany the hospital launch still there and the doctor says you're right your your left leg um you're going to have two options you keep it you're probably going to be on crutches or a wheelchair if you keep it or you can amputate it and I, and I, the first thing I said to him was like, what about my right? Cause you said to me, did they do like tourniquets and shit? Yeah, yeah. So Doc Jones that day, he did the pressure dressing, the stop the bleeding, still going. So he did the tourniquet after that. I was still going. They moved me on a litter. And when they moved me on a litter behind that MRAP, I could smell something burning. And I realized it was my leg. He was putting quick clot on it. What so is I guess, that? Oh, quick to, clot to sort of clot it up real yep, quick? Yep, yeah. Gotcha. And, okay. Uh, so, um, all this, and just by looking at it, you would have thought, my right leg would have been the one I got rid of. Right. And it's, it's still pretty fucked up. I'll be really, I mean, nice scars there. I see an indent there and I have some bone growing where it shouldn't like right here. Some of my thigh, like the fucking multiple, X-Men. multiple shirts. Ooh, yeah. I yeah. gotta tell you, I've been going through the airport. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. What's there? So if I don't know, fucking metal on my leg, <laughs> I'm actually bringing in packages. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, um, yeah, I went to, so you're in, so you're in <laughs> Germany and you're like, well, can't really can't really fight with well, three I, and a I half said, of my limbs. Well, I said, oh, just get rid of it. Get rid of get rid of it then. And I mean, was that um, like a no brainer for you? I think I I didn't know what to handle, but I I could say with confidence at this point, I was taking things pretty well. Yeah, you know what I mean. I I just like well, what the fuck? Am, there's nothing else I can do at this point. So it's just all right. What's the quality of life? Wheelchair and crutches for the rest of my life. Or amputate it and maybe get one of those cool springy legs or some shit like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I've never, this is brand new to me. Nobody ever thinks that this is going to happen to them. I feel like most people think they're going to come home all right or um, they're killed in action. Right. I don't think everybody ever thinks that they're wounded. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I, I think that's human nature. Sure. So I said, I'll get rid of it and get a prosthetic, you know. And meanwhile, my right leg, hardware in the hip. I got a rod going down my femur, a rod going in between a tibia and fibula, and I have what's called a subtalar fusion in my ankle. And this side, literally nothing but an amputation. So it's kind of weird how it all panned out. And I guess internally, they had, from what I understand, the doctor said, I started to get rhabdo. Now, any crossfitters out there, like rhabdo is when your muscles are so, or use so much, or like even someone who constantly runs and they don't right. maybe... I, I don't know exactly how it goes, but like your muscles start to let off potassium and it gets to your kidneys and it can kill you. So what the, di- what, from my so understanding. So it's almost like a weird form of sepsis, like where you, where you become, where you start poisoning. I mean, I, I guess I honestly, I don't know much about it. I don't even know it. if I'm fucking saying the right shit. So <laughs> honestly, I don't know. I don't I just want people out there someday to be like, <laughs> oh, he was right there. And I was like, <laughs> nice gamble. Yeah. So when they took off, when they started to pull the muscle out of this leg, 
And I guess it made it inoperable. So now it's like, that's why they gave me those two options. Right. You know, you could, um, I, I guess at that moment they had to pull the muscle out. I, I don't understand it. I didn't understand it. I'm not arguing with it. I'm here today. At least my dick didn't get blown off. Hey, life is good, right? You know? <laughs> it actually got bigger. Yeah. <laughs> Put it next to the stump. Like, holy yeah. fuck, man. Somehow your dick now has an elbow and no one knows how or why. Um, so anyway. So, where, are we, where are we getting at with all this? Like, well, how do you? So, so now, like, what, what does? And and I and I know I know that that tragedy is not over, right? Um, yes. in your life. So, so I mean, are you looking at it like you know, f- you know, fuck, I can't be there with my brothers? Or are you looking at it like I get to go home? Or I'm looking at it like what's next? What's next? And I'm trying to be positive in all of this. Truly, am right. right. And I eventually, I think I was in Germany for about four or five days. That's it. Because I, I got hurt. Like the day we hit that ID was June third, two thousand eight. I landed in Washington D.C. on June eighth, and in between wow. there, I, I don't know why I remember those dates, but I do. So I landed, um, I landed in Washington D.C. Then and I went to Walter Reed Army Medical Center, back in the states. My family doesn't have the green light yet to let me to come down and see me. I think you know. I think logistically, because now at this point the military is going to pay for their flights or their fuel pay for a room and I think there's a lot of logistics going family. on. Right, 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 right. Okay. And I, I think they also wanted to make sure I was in more of a stable because like they knew I was going to live but right. this this is just my ignorance talking. Yeah. For my like they weren't there when I got initially got there. I think they had to wait a few days because I wanted because I think a lot of what I went through was surgeries and making me a little more stable until they could actually get the green light to come down. So I can imagine they're pretty anxious. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, but also at the game. same time, like you don't want them walking into like, what the f- exactly? You yeah, know what I mean, I like, so like honestly, the, the psychology of it, right? Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I and I respect that totally. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? I get that. All right, so we're gonna stop it right there. Um, next week, next episode or whenever the the hell I'm so (laughs) we don't have a schedule with these things just because of how hectic our life is but I mean I I hope you guys enjoyed the first part and um uh the next part is is all about um just just you know his what Earl's doing now and how he got to doing what he's doing now and it's very inspiring and it's very um what's what's the word it gives you perspective Mm mm-hmm you know, it makes yeah. you, it makes you go, why am I complaining about what happened on Facebook? Truth. You know, or who's posting what on Reddit. <laughs> um, so yeah. we hope, we hope you enjoyed it and, uh, you know, keep an eye out for, uh, part two of, of, uh, our awesome, incredible conversation with Mr. Earl Granville. <laughs>